Perfect. Thank you. Um, good morning. Thanks for, uh, for taking the time to come out. My name is Bob Brennan. I work for a company called Integrated Manufacturing Systems. We've been a progress partner for 32 years, and I've been involved in Open Edge ever since. Topic for today, uh, we're going to talk about SQL 92 access or progress DBAs. But anybody that's interested in using the, the ODBC or JDBC connectivity to get to data that's stored in the Open Edge database. Okay. Who has this need right now still? Yeah? Are you doing it already? So everybody's got it kind of connected. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about the process. Okay. So the agenda for today, make you successful with SQL applications. Um, we're going to go through the Open Edge SQL components and initial connections, the Open Edge database, uh, some of the setups and the controls there, and then Open Edge specific uh, topics. <laughs> Some of the tooling, some of the um, idiosyncrasies of, of sharing uh, the Open Edge platform with the, with the SQL platform, because they are different. <clears throat> Typical use, use case that we find, uh, somebody's got an Open Edge application, typically de developed by a third party, their partner, and the end user wants to use some sort of ODBC compliant <laughs> reporting tool, Crystal Reports, Excel, those sorts of things. Um, so what we're going to talk about is, is how to take care of and tend to this extra, extra layer. In a lot of cases, the third-party partners are just leaving end users on their own. I don't know if that's your experience, but it's certainly mine. And left on their own devices, end users can do some really interesting things in terms of reporting, and if they don't understand some of the concepts like record locking and so forth, they can, uh, they can really hose things up. So try and... Uh, Try and protect users from that. Been doing this talk for a long time. You can tell by the graphics, okay? Um, but it's still all relevant, okay? Basically, this is the, the entire platform. There's more here, but at the bottom, we've got the Open Edge database and other databases that all of our tooling and, and middleware can connect to. For right now, we're going to take out the concept of other databases and just focus on JDBC and ODBC through either the Open Edge or SQL Engine down to the data store. Okay. Important understanding is there's one, one data store that's written to and, and looked at by both the Open Edge servers and the SQL servers. So there's one collection of data. If you install a progress product, um, any of these products will install the drivers locally. Okay? If you don't have a machine that you've previously installed progress on, then the SQL 92 access um, will provide the minimum uh, release of, of product to be able to run uh, ODBC or JDBC. Okay? That's available through the ESD. Uh, site as well. If you have loaded it, if you have loaded a progress product, then wherever you've loaded it and install ODBC, the SQL ODBC setup is uh, the place that you would find the drivers to install, or again, the SQL client through uh, the ESD. Client doesn't have to sit on the server. Uh, so for example, a database can be on something, a client can be on Windows, and it will uh, that's the connectivity, right? So it's client-server. I'm not giving away the store secrets. Uh, this is here just for reference. It's also found in the knowledge base uh, since I think it's either 10.1 or 10.2. Um, the uh, SQL client has been given away for free, and they publish this at the top of the page. So I'm not a crook. Okay. If you're on Windows, um, there's 32-bit and 64-bit in the old days. Okay, 32-bit, this is where the manager sits. 64-bit, this is where the manager sits. And by default, if you're running 
32-bit, uh, then you have to go looking for this one. So if you have a 64-bit database, you have to find the 64-bit manager and driver to, for it to work. Okay. So the application 32-bit uh, client is necessary for a 32-bit uh, database, 64 or 64, you can't, can't mismatch them, okay, or it doesn't work. So therefore, knowing where to get to the database manager is, is important. Once you've installed a driver, one of the things you need to do is create a, uh, a DSN, and, and this is a, a sample just for the pug. Sorry? Um, for the pug, where are we putting it? What port number are we on? This should all look comfortable to everybody that's spun up a, an open edge database before. Um, where we're going to find a few things of interest are on the advanced tab. Okay? And I'm going to point out a few things. We're going to come back to the default isolation level in a, uh, in a moment. The, um, the fetch array size is basically the number of rows that are coming back, and um, it, it's, it by default seems to run okay, okay? If you start chasing that number down, that number is, is per connection or per creation. So depending on what you're reporting on, you may be able to put more or less uh, rows into the, uh, the allocated memory, right? So uh, just understand that you can mess around with how many records or how many rows you're getting back by changing that. I've never found a good use case for having to change that. Maybe some of you have, we'll talk about it. Um, the other is, as a deprecated feature, you used to be able to um, not get the timestamp with the time zone back. Now everything comes back with that, so you get time zone data as well. On the connection, it used to uh, put a um, a command in to send this or uh, send that into the, the data set. Um, like I said, we've been doing this for a long time. Anybody that's running version 9, version 10, uh, I think it was around 11 where that, uh, that came out. Okay. So let's talk about a couple of concepts before we get into talking about that isolation level. Okay. Concept of a dirty read is when a user is updating or inserting a record and a different user is reading it, but the work hasn't been committed yet. Right? So, so since we're talking SQL, some SQL commands, basically A is putting something into the database, B, while he's doing it, reads something, A executes a rollback, so what data does, does uh, A and B, what do they see? Okay? So a, a dirty read is when you're reading records while somebody else is updating them. A non-repeatable read is a read operation on the record that has an updated value. Okay, again, the, the section. In a phantom read, instead of updating data, is putting records into the database. Okay, when you come around, if you're using SQL for reporting purposes, then you have to decide which of those three categories you want to allow. Okay. That gets us into the discussion of what the isolation level actually means. Okay. In most uh, applications that we've seen, people are reading at a read uncommitted level. Okay. Um, these are the four isolation levels that were in the drop down for the DSN definition. And then as you come down, it gets more and more restrictive of, in terms of what you'll do. We've always looked at this as a reporting feature, not a development feature, okay? We try very hard to get end users not to use Excel as a data entry tool directly into the database, typically because our users are folks that are working with a, uh, a piece of software that somebody else wrote. That's, in, you know, they spent a lot of money on the business logic for all of that, okay? And uh, by letting people just pluck numbers into the database, you circumvent all of the business logic, so who knows what you're doing to relational integrity, right? So we, we are uh, never proponents of directly injecting data into a database, okay? So the four versions, again, read uncommitted is basically a for each no lock. Um, read, 
uh, committed is only taking data that has been, uh, has been updated, okay, in the database. Um, it's kind of how the, the 4GL or ABL works by default. A repeatable read is basically uh, the same as a for each exclusive lock. If you are updating data, data nobody else is going to be able to touch it until you're done with it. And serializable means you locked everything and until you're done, nobody's getting hold of, of anything. Questions on the isolation levels? Okay. I, th I throw this slide in just so that you understand that the capability is there. Um, you can create connections, connections to, multiple to multiple databases, databases at, at the time. time. Okay, uh, if you do that, only the primary database can be changed, all the other ones are read-only. You have to have the full path of the database uh, when you, if you're starting in the admin server or explorer. Um, everything needs to be on the same code page. Uh, in terms of reading, that's not bad because if you've got a multi-database application, uh, you can set your reporting tools as long as your reporting tools understand that difference. Um, and again, we, we shy, shy away from the update uh, applications, but just understand if your world requires or allows updating, then capability is here. Okay, so that, that's the client side, right? We had a driver, we had a, a DSN to connect to the database. How do we deal with this on the, on the server side, okay? By default, the default server setup is we end up with one broker uh, that spins up, that handles SQL clients and ABL clients, and everything kind of goes through the, the same broker. We don't want to do that, just in terms of best practice and to be able to isolate uh, both types of connections. We want to have uh, something more aligned, aligned with this. So ABL or ABL Clients go through an ABL broker or brokers. Uh, SQL go through their or single broker, multiple servers, right? So everything's isolated from it. So how do we do that? We set the ABL broker, the server type of 4GL, and, and some numbers. We'll come back to what all this stuff means in a minute. And then, I think I've got one more animation, there we go. We have a secondary broker uh, with a uh, server type of SQL, and you'll notice on the right-hand side the dash M3, little M3, this means it's a secondary broker. Okay. The secondary broker uses one minus MN for itself. So part of, of this now, when you have this more complicated environment, uh, we need to be able to kind of manage the, let's see if I can do this. Hey, what do you know? So we have just a little tool that we use that when we go into a customer site asking about uh, or talking to the DBAs about how many uh, 4GL servers, how many SQL servers, there's one extra broker. We use this to try and define what the startup parameters are going to be so that the math works. Okay, because you have the concept of total number of servers, maximum clients per server, maximum number of servers, and so forth, right? So the math can get pretty complicated or unwieldy. And it's really easy to tell when you go and you look at somebody's server and they don't have the math right. It's like somebody wasn't thinking. Now, this is the minimum, okay? We typically will start up whatever the 4GL side is going to be, and then some number of of uh, client connections, okay? We have talked with other people who will create multiple secondary brokers, okay, for 4GL, so that the admin people or the management people can get in, so they have their own pathways in, right? So the minimum is gonna be two, you may end up with, may end up with more, okay? This spreadsheet will be part of the download for the, um, for the slides and so forth as well, okay? It's not complete, it's not a whole DBA thing, it's, it's a tool just to make sure the math works out, okay? 
And, and the last thing I need is some of the DBA gurus. Oh, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. It's not intended for that, okay? It's really around uh, making sure you understand what's the implication of number of users, number of servers, kind of what else comes in, just to make sure that your numbers match up so that you don't say, you don't create a system where you allow more connections than the server allows, right? And then you get things going nuts. We good with this? Okay. All right. Okay. So we have the database connection set up. We have the client connection set up. Now we're going to try and connect something. One of the first things you're going to run into is, is security, right? And there's, there's two concepts of security or two concepts we need to discuss relative to security. One is authentication. It's me identifying myself to the database and then validate I am who I say I am, okay? And then authorization. And the second one is where we get tripped up. Uh, being that I am who I say I am, what am I allowed to do? Okay. So in the, in the database, we have this concept of the user ID and password saved in the database. You may or you may not, depends on how you've architect architected your application. Okay. It's not required in your 4GL application, but if you want to do anything productive on the SQL side, you need to have uh, user set up, okay? So in the case where users haven't been created, okay, there's no passwords together, you're not authenticated, you can be whoever you say you want to be, okay? Um, you're not able to do much unless you were the person that created the database or you know an authorized user who was the database and, and they're gonna grant you some privilege, okay? So by default, when somebody creates a database, they become the DBA for that database. They are then empowered to grant to you, and we're gonna walk through all of this in a few minutes, the access to the resources of the database, okay? Is that a session? So the, the initial creation of the database is based on uh, who you were when you created the database, okay? If I grant to you, uh, you're a DBA now, because I trust you, okay? Um, it, it, so we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna touch on what happens. Uh, in fact, hold, hold that, because we're, we're gonna come back to that. Uh, Julian raises an interesting point of, of, about w at what point do things commit or get rolled back. So. Okay. So if user, if user uh, entries have been created, right, then when we connect, we uh, validate who we are through the password. Validated users either are defined by the DBA or the system administrator. They have certain rights. So what, what we're trying to avoid is when we log in, this authorization failure. So authorization failure basically means you, we don't know that your credentials are valid in the database. Okay. So if you are authenticated, now we have to determine what you are allowed to do. SQL uses a grant uh, model, which basically says that you're not allowed to do anything until somebody says it's okay for you to do something, and it's somebody in power or somebody that's a DBA or so forth, okay? If you're a DBA, if you get given DBA privileges, okay, then you can kind of do full operations on the database. Or we can uh, restrict you to uh, tables and objects within tables, okay? The DBA always is the person that controls this, so they can grant and revoke your access to things. So be nice to your DBAs. 
Right. So let's do a couple of samples or examples. So if I've connected, so I've authenticated into the database and I have a, a tool or I'm doing it from a, like a WinSQL type of application or a Crystal Reports application or something like that, and I select star from customer and I get access denied. It could be one of two things. One, I'm not authorized to uh, be able to get to the customer table. Or two, we may have an issue where you're not authorized to get into that schema. And we'll talk about what a schema is here in a second. So to get around that, I can do one of two things. I can grant, as a DBA, I can grant to you either DBA powers to a username, okay? If you're DBA, you can do anything. If it's a resource, you can create stuff or change stuff depending on the resource that we give you, okay? Or we can do it for specific uh, tables or views. So there's a granularity in here that you have to understand before you just start rolling things out, okay? Um, the, the big case for us, typically, we do a lot of stuff in manufacturing, okay? So ERP systems and systems of record for shop floor control and whatever, but invariably they have some chunk of information that's financial, and a lot of times it's payroll information, okay? So the idea of just giving whoever the, the report writer is carte blanche access to the database um, is usually frowned on, because they don't want some guy in IT trouncing through everybody's employment records, right? So instead of granting DBA access, they end up doing is granting privileges for, for specific tables. And in reality, they're, by saying you can have all of these but these few things, they're basically isolating those few things away, okay? And this is the area where we can control, select is basically read, inserts putting a record in, deleting a record out. Um, uh, we can uh, set updates on columns and so forth. It's pretty powerful stuff, but there's a lot of knobs to, to twist. If you don't have your, um, if you don't have a good idea of what people, what you want people to be able to do, this this can get troubling pretty quickly. So. so here's some just simple. Grant select on pub customer to Bob. We'll, we'll come around and parse that out. Or select uh, uh, to public on uh, order line. Using the, the public as opposed to a specific user allows everybody to be able to read that. Okay, so that's one thing. The, a really good uh, white paper um, out on uh, the uh, website about additional details about how to do all this. I'm gonna show you a sample uh, before we get there, coming back to Julian's point. Everything that you do in SQL, at some point, you commit your work or, or it's going to roll back. So if I create a whole bunch of, of user information or reporting information or records in the database during, in my session and I don't commit my work, when I log out, all of it goes away. Okay? So, good catch. Most, re uh, most reporting tools that allow you to do entry will insert a commit, but make, make sure you know what tools you're using, right? Okay. So in, uh, in OpenEdge, there's a, a SQL EXP, a SQL Explorer command line tool that lets you do a bunch of things relative to the SQL engine. Okay, what we're doing up here is we're connecting to my uh, sports, uh, or I guess my pug database. Um, a username assist progress, a password assist progress. We're inputting a grant doll file. We're outputting whatever the output is. This is the content of my my grant doll, right? So I've got a user, SQL user, with a password, a read one two three. What we're doing is we're giving them grants to benefits, bills to, and, and bin, and we're committing our work, right? So when all of this runs, this user ought to be able to go in and be able to query these three uh, tables, 
and, and nothing else, but everything in those three tables, okay? Now it's outside of it. You create the user. Okay. So you remember before when I was talking about it, I didn't want all the nittering DBAs? Yeah. <laughs> it's probably the worst thing to call you. Um, you were asking about LRU skips, though, last night. Okay, so anyway, bef before we get sidetracked, there is a default user and password called sysprogress, okay, that connects to the database. Um, that username is built in as a default DBA to the database so that we can get stuff started in terms of creating things. One of the problems that you run into is if a third party has developed your application and created the database and then shipped it to you, you have no idea that Mike at XYZ company was the creator, nor do you know his credentials to be able to connect. Right? So sysprogress and sysprogress get you into the database okay, to be able to uh, uh, manipulate some of this. First thing that ought to happen is that ought to get changed. Either get rid of the username by creating another DBA or at least change the password. Okay, this is like the biggest open door into everybody's thing. It's the worst kept secret. <laughs> okay, questions about that? Yeah. Who's got sysprogress still enabled? Yeah, yeah. it's not uncommon. Okay. So we came back around, right? And, and we tried to do select star from customer, possible reasons, it's no authorization, or schema scope. Let's talk about schemas for a minute. In the SQL world, a schema is not meta metadata, it's not area six, it's a collection of um, uh, oh, it's a way of collecting and, and grouping together objects in the database, okay? In this particular example, we have two setups, right? One for the schema called pub, and one for the schema called public, or people, okay? The pub schema is, if you're granted access to the pub schema, we can grant you access to these uh, tables as well. If you're only given access to people, then it's gonna be the other one. So it's, it's a way of, of cordoning off or separating whether, you, whether they are like types of files or not, logical, consistent breakdowns of files. Okay, it can be files, it can be views, it can be um, uh, bo both of those, okay. So the default schema in progress is pub. So if I log in as sysprogress or as a DBA and I haven't created any extra um, schemas, then I can access everything as pub.table name and be able to access all of the data, okay? So ABL uses a hidden pub. So if we come back through and say pub.customer, we can access the SQL, okay? We can create a a synonym, public synonym, for pub.customer, so that if a uh, way of around having to be specific about your schema every time, uh, create this, um, and then if somebody says customer, behind the scenes it gets tra translated to pub. You can also set it as a registry entry for the, for the DSN, okay? But this thing trips up most people, the concept that they come from ABL, pub is hidden, we don't understand schemas, we start to do reporting and everything kind of falls apart. Probably the biggest. Let's let that build out. So how to get how to get through this, right? You do this, the try to get to the customer, authorization has failed. Uh, first thing is, uh, if I've been granted my schema as a schema and customers in there, we're past this. I can use the default pub.schema and I'm past it, or I can set 
a, uh, a schema default for my session and then use it as well. For the people that are already doing SQL stuff, do you have your own schema set up or do you just run off a of pub? Pub? Pub, 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 pub. Pub? Okay. So in a, a multi-part database query, remember I told you we can connect multiple databases together. Uh, fully qualified name is, a, is the catalog, which is the database the data lives in, then the schema, the column, and all the way down to the column name. Right? So there's four levels in that. Just an example of what that looks like. Okay, ABL typically has three. That's the database, the table, and the, and the field. All right. So, um, SQL is a standard. SQL 92 is a standard. SQL 92 was active and current in 1992. Now 2023. In between, lots of vendors have taken SQL and built up and changed and, and, and altered things, right? So while well, SQL is a standard, every vendor seems to have their own dialect. Our access into the Open Edge database, database that's created by Open Edge, um, is through what progress has given us, through the drivers and, and through the uh, that data access layer. So it's confusing to people who come from, say, um, an Oracle world where the, uh, where the upkeep onto the standards has been maybe a little more followed than what's happened on the progress side. Right? So y you have to work with the tool set that you have. And that all I'm saying is that the vendor, uh, each vendor has their own dialect. There are certain things that just aren't going to work here because they're not implemented. Okay. Is, that, is that fair to? Is that a nice way of saying that? <laughs> Good. So what's specific about OpenEdge? Uh, Non-standard names, right? Hyphenated names. SQL standard doesn't let you do hyphens, but OpenEdge does. So how do we get through that? If we run this select cust-num from customer, we'll get a customer not found. A uh, solution to that is to double quote uh, the uh, the field. My experience is most of the reporting tools, most of the current reporting tools, will do that for you automatically. But if you're writing by hand, you got to know that. Okay. Concept of overstuffed fields. So here's a difference between uh, what progress allows and what the SQL world allows. Right. In in seek in in progress, we have the concept of of variable length uh, fields in the database, which means that a database architect can say, oh, my customer number field is going to be six characters long. And the application can come, come along and stuff 20 characters into it, and everything runs, because it's just kind of a suggestion, and it's kind of a default for some reporting, but it doesn't mean much of anything. In SQL, it matters an awful lot, because it says, you told me you were only going to put six in here, and you've put more in here. You're bad. I might not give you your data back. I might truncate your data. I might do a bunch of things. Right? So that, that difference in uh, operation, we need a, we need a way of, of handling it. Okay? But we're lucky enough that they gave us a couple of tools to be able to handle that. Okay? We can use uh, fixed width via SQL to go through and alter the meta schema on the SQL side. That's one way of doing it. Don't recommend that. Because again, we don't like people updating anything on the SQL side. Uh, number two, there's a, uh, a DB tool application in your DLC bin directory that does just this. Okay, so it, this tool um, allows you to run against either particular tables or particular area numbers, and uh, will uh, report or fix the uh, number of places where the data exceeds the uh, width 
in the meta schema for the SQL side of things, okay? So if you have those errors coming up, it just means that you've overstuffed your values. You can go through and, and create them uh, or update them once at a time, uh, one time. The, the idea is that whatever the maximum amount, whatever the longest field is at the current time, we can do a, a padding of a percentage even bigger than that. It seems to work okay. Every once in a while you'll run into something where it really is variable length data. Um, things that where, where this drives me nuts, when people have uh, comments or long chars and, and things in the database that just, they can be randomly sized. And the original intent was we're, we're putting a quip in here and somebody decides to write a novel about how wonderful this particular attribute is, um, that, that causes this to be a headache, okay? But there, you know, the tool's here. Okay. We have a progress client startup, check with, um, that allows you to do one of three things. Uh, one is default is to ignore the with value, okay, or store the data and join, generate a, uh, a warning, or don't store the data and generate an error, okay. Um, these seem to be uh, not something I encounter regularly, okay, but the capability is, is there. Um, the idea of somebody creating a record or updating a record and, and the system saying, now you can't enter that, is, is completely opposite of let them do whatever they're going to do because we got them to the point of committing something. Let them do it and we'll, we'll fix it later. Um, we, we tend to fall on the side of we're lucky enough to have the users actually talking to us and doing things. Don't, don't shut them out, just a thought. And this is just the area you'll see both on the screen and in the log file. So a couple more updates that came through in 11.5.1 ADT is authorized data truncation. Um, it is the first step in fixing the problem. Um, I, I wouldn't rely on it because basically what happens is it returns the data value truncated to the amount that the uh, SQL meta schema says. So if people are counting on the complete value coming out and they're only getting a partial value out, that may or may not be uh, uh, helpful. The, uh, the parameter can be both on the server and the client. If it's on the client, it takes uh, precedent. The real, the better fix uh, came in autonomous schema update in 11.6 and, and forward. It builds on the uh, data truncation. The records are expanded, but the first time the data comes through, it is the truncated data comes back. So it hands you the data, and then it goes through and it changes the schema. So what I've seen uh, some of our customers end up doing is write these ridiculous queries that go through everything and touch everything and just kind of use this in a nonsensical report to get everything fixed up. On the second read, everything is at the, the right level. Make sense? So, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. The next thing that uh, OpenEdge allows is a concept of arrays or extents. Not so much in SQL. Not so much in SQL 92, okay? So what happens now on a, uh, an open edge application is the results are semicolon separated and their uh, uh, bar char values are brought back out. Okay, so starting in 10.1a, we're able to uh, use this extent notation similar to what you know about in ABL, to be able to get specific entries out of things. Okay. Another technique 
for this is to, uh, to break out the, um, uh, the data array element into a, a view, right? And then I can work with the, uh, with the view as opposed to the element itself. Okay. Of the people that are doing this already, how, how many people have created their own views? You got to count. Yeah, yeah. It's not, for whatever reason, it, it, it solves a lot of, of complexity, and, and people just seem to tend to trundle around it and not take advantage of it. I'm not, I'm not sure why. We'll check later. Not sure. Not sure. Um, one of the other topics that's unique to SQL and not so much for the 4GL is kind of when you run a query, how do we determine how to resolve that query? How does the, the database engine resolve that? And uh, there's this whole concept of statistics kept on the database that, uh, based on the number of records and how you've op operated with the, with the database, um, that information is helpful in terms of, of determining what the best path through that data would be to return the result set for your query, right? So There's a, a concept called updating statistics in SQL that uh, updates in the meta schema the information around all of the record counts and index counts and what's been used and, and not that comes to uh, be part of the query resolution uh, at, um, at runtime. So there's a, there's a, um, SQL command about updating table statistics or index, index statistics um, uh, and, and column statistics across your database. So part of improving performance of the SQL side of things is making sure that you're running update statistics. Um, typical rule of, of thumb is if about 20% of the data changes in the database, then running update statistics seems to be a, uh, a value, okay? Uh, incredible, the number of times we walk in someplace. Have you ever done that? What's that? Oh, oh, you're complaining this is running slow. Let me see if I can help. <laughs> okay? Um, you can also do it on particular tables. So if you have certain tables that are just massively updated, some sort of, of transaction, yes? If, let me think. What's the, uh, what's the issue or what's the benefit of column statistics? Nothing springing to mind. Yeah. Really? Okay. Okay, so the, the, the answer offered was that column statistics keeps... Very cool. Glad I came. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. Free beer on me tonight. <laughs> No, no, it's not instantaneous, but um, there is a load that happens because it's going through and, and churning uh, locally on the on the server, 
right? So whatever you're doing there, you're not doing for other things. Um, we tend to do it on off hours and just run it, script it, and have people do it um, like once a quarter sort of thing. So, Because it all comes back to if, if the recommendation coming out of progress is 20% of the data changed. I don't know what that means. It's, it's the same way of going back to like the DN, uh, DSN and saying, how many records am I returning? Well, it depends on what I'm asking, right? So just instead of figuring out how many uh, angels are dancing on the head of the pin, just, you know, doing it at some point is better than walking in and, oh, we've never done it and we've been running this for, for 12 years, so. Correct, correct. So a um, couple of other uh, questions that have come up over the years of doing the talk. Um, is there a way to grant a user select privilege for all tables in one statement? And the answer is no. So you have to enumerate the tables that you want uh, or grant them DBA, which will give them carte blanche. Um, does the field level extent uh, reporting what uh, what happens uh, where members are separated by uh, semicolons. Uh, all of the data types work properly. Um, if there's a semicolon, the data returned. What happens is it does the semicolon uh, will be preceded by the uh, tilde. That's the right term. So, Ju Julian, your your question about the unknown value. Do, do either of you know what happens at the, the point? I don't. Okay. Well, yeah, and it, it, it turns, it also turns that concept of it's yes or no or true or false. It breaks all of that, right? It just in terms of what's the unknown value. It's neither of those, so, okay. Uh, so in the last little bit here, uh, some extra topics. Invariably, the way that uh, we find out uh, that a customer has ventured down the road of doing their own SQL reporting and, and hasn't talked to anybody is they go through and finally get something running. It's usually Crystal Reports or one of those types of tools. Um, and everything's fine, and the guy that set it up is long gone, and. It's just, it's worked, and we rely on running these reports every day and every month and so forth. And then they update their database, or they move servers, or they do something that changes the database where the database itself, the open edge database, was gone through a dump and a load kind of process. And they come in on Monday morning, and none of the reporting works. A okay. uh, couple of, of tools that are useful, SQL dump and SQL load will move data that is only for the SQL side of things in and out of the database. Right? It's the same data store. We can have tables that are only available under SQL. We can have tables that are only available, well, anything that's under uh, Open Edge, we can get to by SQL, right? So the ability to move data in and out, we don't tend to deal with that. But the SQL schema is the big one, right? Because we've done all this work about we've granted you DBA and we've granted you read access and we've done all of these things, right? We've, uh, everything we've talked about for the past 45 minutes, we got it all set up. When you start a new database up, none of that exists. So how do I go about bringing those forward? The SQL schema will uh, let you move things in and out. Again, that's the you know, new database, ODBC needs to be set up, go live, and the reporting all breaks. So what we went through was kind of where do the drivers come from? How do we get the drivers inside of the 4GL or ABL, sorry? Um, the, uh, the place where that uh, kit comes from, how you get it, how you install it, how to maintain it both on the client and on the server. We went through some things relative to the Open Edge uh, SQL applications, things that are specific to Open Edge. I think we've covered most of it. Questions? Yep.
set in portfolio lines, then this is the uh, latest security is part of the function. Exists can read, can write, can read, can dump. Yeah. Yeah. But those lines, also they are not visible to the scope lines. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you really create a uh, venue setting, uh, uh, some rights on ground uh, select on some those sites are not visible for the old I don't so think we have the concept. Yeah. Creating roles. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you have, no, the same problem exists in OGL because it is very interesting why so many, for so many years, uh, no one initiated that request for progress to have roles. Because then you have not that high users as it is in marketing to uh, uh, presentation, but you have tens or hundreds of users. Mm -hmm. So settings, uh, setting those data access controls for exact user, you even be using those asterisks, uh, some trying to, to, to create those artificial groups or roles in those uh, security, uh, security definitions, but it looks at the same room. Because that if you have, for example, one button of users, mm -hmm. you have to set up for grant select, grant update, uh, grant everything for, for each user. So that roles can help them. Because the question was, do we have roles? No. Okay. No. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being flip as far as I'm aware. I mean, at the point that this was put together, there's no concept of a role. Uh, that question uh, I found in one database was not this uh, object uh, uh, in data definition by SQL. And it is very interesting when the type SQL is defined in that table, mm -hmm. uh, so you cannot uh, add those for the eyes at all. Correct, because that's a port, uh, that's a, a SQL only data store. can't get to it anyway. You can't get That's that's definitely a, I mean I 
it's it's a corner case, and just in terms of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, just maybe it needs uh, just uh, but I even do not know if, for, for example, CRC will be not changed. <laughs> so maybe some recompilation will be needed, something needs to be planned, because even I <coughs> about nothing written in documentation about that to move hypersquare definition was in, 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 in years. So the, the, the concept of a SQL-only table, as far as I understand, right, I, I don't work for progress. I didn't do any of the architecture and not a product manager. Like, yeah, they're, they're not, right. yeah. So, so the SQL, the, the tables that are marked as SQL are, are created and consumed and updated and managed by SQL users, not ABL users. So it, it's consistent that you can't make, in, in my mind, it's consistent that you can't make uh, controls at the ABL level because you're not supposed to be able to, to touch them. Your question about, well, somebody put it in pub, right? My, my guess is that's an unexpected, it's a bug or an unexpected uh, behavior. My guess. I, I, anybody else got a... Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Just, just. yeah. yeah. sense that if you have a situation like that now in, in modern versions that you can get rid of the secondary uh, brokers and, and restart those without having to take down the primary broker. It might be but it's still very painful that client yeah. is doing just uh, select, select uh, data and still get the yeah. uh, database block but it's uh, staying forever. It's not very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's, there's a couple of things. So in, in our experience, 2006, 2008, the SQL engine was very ropey, very dodgy, I think. Uh, uh, but now it seems to be incredibly stable. So okay. maybe that's that that actually the, the other thing that bites a lot of people, though, they don't, or they, they don't get or don't understand at first, is that triggers in the database don't, don't not like, execute. Yeah. Is that ABL triggers mm. and vice versa. So if you have an SQL trigger, the ABL will trigger it and vice versa. So you've got to duplicate your logic if you want to do that. So a couple of quick things, if I could. There is now an, an autonomous 
uh, update statistics in version 12. Okay. So you don't have to do it yourself manually, update the statistics. And how's that implemented? I, I, it was in version 12, that's all I know. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, it, it, it's, it's like startup parameter yeah. on the database that yeah. turns through it, so you don't have to do it. Right, so you, you set it up and it does it autonomously. Um, the other thing is I'm just reading our documentation, which is scary. Um, <laughs> but it says we do support blobs in SQL now. Okay. Um, and I, I can show you the link, but that's all I know about it, <laughs> is that it was there. It's a little scary. You read the docs. <laughs> The trick with the docs is knowing how to search our docs. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks. Thanks for uh, spending some time with me and be around the rest of the, the show here if you want to talk about specific things or not. Uh, but, you know, that's my world. That's my experience. And I appreciate you taking some time and sharing your experiences with me. Thank you.